Hey y'all, and welcome to Familypreneur, the podcast for family-first entrepreneurs building profitable and progressive businesses. If we haven't met yet, I'm your host, Meg Brunson, and my pronouns are she, her. Before we get started, I want to remind you that this podcast episode isn't gonna change a thing in your business unless you take action. And the best way to follow through is by joining us inside of the Familypreneur Business Accelerator. It's where we work, win, celebrate, and grow together. Head over to familypreneur.co to join us today. All right, let's do this. Hey, hey, familypreneurs. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode. Today, we're going to be talk about, talking about rethinking education. So if you are a teacher who has, hasn't lost your passion for teaching and you still want to teach, um, but you don't necessarily want to do it in the schools, or if you are a parent who's lost your belief in the educational system, but you still value your kids being around at least a small group of kids, this session may be for you. Cindy Lumpkin, known also as the LD coach, is a teacher turned school founder. She resigned her post in a large urban school district in 2011 after having been a successful special education teacher, including a co-teacher and an administrator, leading over 12 special ed teachers and paraprofessionals to pursue being a stay-at-home mom and eventually running Triumph in Life, Inc., a nonprofit organization that she founded and operates Triumph School under. The mission is to inspire and educate those with dyslexia and other learning disabilities. Cindy, I'm so excited to have you here today. Oh, thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> now, I know we just read your bio, but let's talk a little bit about that transition. So you were in the school system and you decided you wanted to leave that traditional employment as a teacher and start your own school. What did that process look like? Okay, so um, it wasn't a, a, a seamless process. I honestly didn't realize that I was going to eventually open my own school. For me, um, what you see a lot of teachers going through today happened to me almost 10 years ago. I've always been so passionate about education, particularly marginalized um, populations. Um, and the, the school or the district that I was working in, it was a large urban district. And I really just felt like I was a part of the problem due to no fault of my own. Um, I just had so many kiddos. I happen to have been a high school teacher. I just had so many kiddos who would come into high school still being either a non-reader or reading at the third grade level. And we were putting these children in like general ed classes under the under the disguise of inclusion, and they really couldn't handle it. It was like they weren't learning anymore because now you're just trying to push this content and which they didn't even have the skills to learn the content. And so um, I just really honestly got tired of that. And at the time, there was no reason for me to just up and quit my job, right? <laughs> I've always knew that I have the heart of, the te of a teacher. Um, and so I just kind of went along with things. And then eventually I got pregnant. And at that point, I was like, hey, I think I want to be a stay-at-home mom. And so my husband was like, uh, I'm not sure, but eventually I won him over. But <laughs> after being home for about three years, both my daughter and I agreed that we were, we were not the typical stay at home mom child. And so it was at that point where, you know, I was like, okay, if I'm not going to, you know, be this to typical stay at home mom, like, what are you going to do? Are you going to go back to the school system? And my husband realizing that how much that impacted me, you know, as far as really not feeling as I, as if I was being as effective as I could have been if it wasn't for all of the crap. Um, he basically said, well, Cindy, you know, you have this nonprofit organization. Won't you pick it up and see what you can do for it? And, um, I did. Matter of fact, I had the nonprofit when I was still working in public schools because I started it when I got into administration. I missed the kids. So I used to mentor. And uh, but I picked it up and did some research. And lo and behold, one day I woke up and found myself with an accredited school. 
Man. And I know that had to have been frustrating being in a position where, you know, as a teacher, where you feel like kids are just coming through and they're not even equipped to be at, at where they are and you're being held to those standards still. And you can't just, I feel like I have personal experience with that process. And as a parent, I know how frustrating it can be. Mm -hmm. um, I can only imagine it's equally as frustrating right. for, for the teacher. And this option really gives you a lot more um, control, right? Like running your own private school than going through the public school system. How does that compare? And like, are there still requirements that you have to follow like per grade level? Or is that more relaxed? Oh, it's definitely a lot more relaxed. You know, as a private school, I think you would be so surprised the, of the oversight <laughs> that's there. Um, so, but it's totally different. And in my case, it really has been a dream because I've been able to still work with some of the same students that I were, was working with in public schools and really have seen the what the result of when you have a child that meets the right envir environment with the right instruction. Um, I have taught 18 year old men how to read who dropped out of school because they were non readers and was just completely embarrassed. Um, we have so many success stories um, that it kind of blows my mind now to think that I could have this impact, right? Mm -hmm. um, that you think would be being produced out of the public education system, to be real honest. And what I'm learning, it has really challenged me to change my perspective. You know, at one point, I was not a huge fan of school choice because I really felt like it was a way of, you know, people who were already rich and powerful to continue to go and create spaces, <laughs> you know, where mm -hmm. others are excluded. And what I eventually started to see was one, that's going to happen anyway. When you, when you have that type of money, you know, they're going to do what they want to do. But what I realized is a lot of people who don't have options and they are forced to take what's given to them, that's not always the right way either. And uh, once again, I've worked with students who typically could not afford private education. And if it wasn't for this itty bitty school, they wouldn't have a bachelor's degree right now. They wouldn't be, you know, working full time with enough confidence to um, really embrace that adult adult lifestyle that they have walked into. Like it has just been a dream to even, I, I, I tell people that my school is a cross between a private school and a home school, okay? Because that's how relational that I get to be. And I have embraced using everything, including the community to create an environment where students are learning and that it is not something being forced down them. I do a lot of inspiring and encouraging. Um, I also do a lot of give and take, which in public school, sometimes it was difficult. You know, you can't say, listen, spend 15 minutes on this task and I'll let you go over here and sit for 30 minutes. You, <laughs> you know, you, you couldn't, you couldn't do that. You couldn't say that. But now when in my environment, when I meet these, what I call educational or instruction, instruction resistant students, the only way you, you can't play them in a power struggle, right? So if you're not going to physically make them do something, you have to inspire them. And sometimes I have to give up my power, right? And I don't mind that because I have learned when you do that and you do it strategically, eventually they give it back to you. Because they've never, they've all, kids have always had someone to tell them what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, and don't give them a voice. Um, I, I just think of one of my students who came to me about, what, three years ago, and um, Peyton was like 14 years old, and he was, he's not my typical profile child as far as being um, low income, mother and father well educated. He is on the spectrum, but he was a non-reader. For whatever reason, it just hadn't happened. Smart kid now. Mm -hmm. Vocabulary was there, but wasn't a decoder. 
Payton and I, 15 minutes a day for an academic school year, had Payton reading by the end of the school year. And I, like, once again, it's like, I'm like, okay, I knew I was a good teacher, but am I that good of a teacher? <laughs> and I would still say uh, it, it's, it's, it's not that. It's more so that I was able to create an environment where kids feel comfortable, that they gain their confidence, and then they 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 learn to try. And then they also, I, I teach kind of some components of the growth mindset that failure is okay. Matter <laughs> of fact, sometimes, you know, I like to fail, you know, because now I understand what I need to go um, back and learn or what I need to work on more in order, to, you know, to get to wherever I'm going. I love Gosh, I just love everything that you just said. I feel like as a parent, we know, right, that our kids don't always fit in the box. And when you're going through the public school system, mm -hmm. it's yeah. it's really like a, a business, right? Like there's, it's a business and they're pushing these kids through. And if your kids don't fit in the box, they don't necessarily go through in the way that that the world would have them go through. And in the same respect, once you were removed from that box, that school was putting you in, you were able to thrive, your kids are able to thrive. And you brought up something that I, I was actually wanted to ask you next is what is the, the difference mm -hmm. between what you're doing uh, between starting a small school and homeschooling? Like what is the differentiator there? And how do you decide? I feel like in one sense, I want to ask, how do you decide which one you want to do? And in the other sense, I want to ask like, if you're already homeschooling, um, how do you determine if you want to switch? So I don't know if there's a way to answer kind of all of that in one go. <laughs> okay, so it seems kind of weird, but I, I think I understand what you're saying. I think the difference for me is that, one, I am educating other people's children, and then I am a teacher, right? And so for me, although I value that the feel of homeschooling, I, I value the scheduling and the flexibility um, because technically this is still a business. I knew that I had to be able to package this in a way that would be palatable to people who was not or who were who one is probably not used to homeschooling one. Right. Mm -hmm. And then two, uh, financially, just because of that probably isn't looking for um, a private school. So, um, but to be honest, my little school, I've probably never had more than 12 students. So a lot looks the same other than I do meet at a commercial facility, generally a church. Um, and that I am a certified teacher mm. um, and that I'm accredited. So I've gone through some paperwork um, that gives me that title. Um, and that was important for me because of once again, the population for the most part that I work with um, because we are a nonprofit, you know, the service that we provide is not generally the uh, cost that would be if you just went to uh, one of your more traditional private schools. And I guess I'm wondering, like for people listening, but even to if they were, if they like this idea and were interested in starting a school, what does that process look like? Okay. So it definitely, it's, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's not difficult. You just have to know that that is your goal and then be committed to the process. And, but if um, there's someone listening today that is really, really interested, I would say go for it. Now more than ever, we see how education has changed. And a lot more of us are understanding that we don't just want our children to wear a shirt. It's not about just going to the big, building anymore. And we understand that there are different types of environments that suit different children, you know, even better. And so even with what's going on with teachers right now, because so much power is being taken away from us, it really takes away from your creativity. It takes away from you being the best teacher that you can be when you just have someone that says, here, teach this, like this, 
for this amount of time for whatever it takes all it drains you of your passion and and that's that's why I had to leave because there was nothing left there of the person who really knew she was called to this education like school took all of that out of me right and so um if you are interested then the first step basically would be just to get start your business structure determine whether or not you're going to be this LLC or a, a nonprofit organization and then um you just start thinking about like who your clientele is right now uh once again and i, I think that's the other thing is that you have to put on your business person hat. Um, I often say, um, and my fellow teachers, please do not come for me, but I often say that teachers have low self-esteem. Like we act as if we're such one dimensional people and we are not. But I, I feel like we have um, taken on that identity because society as a whole just have not valued us. They just have not really seen how much we bring. But I am realizing now or I'm being able to say, hey, not only am I a teacher, I am really a businesswoman. And I I still have issues like saying that because I see myself as a teacher. But most of the things that I've done really falls in the line of being an entrepreneur. And um, so you have to think of yourself as a business person and then you just have to accept that because you are teachers have so many transferable skills that it is it's, it's, it's like mind-blowing when you really sit down and be like oh okay i can do that oh you know that relates to this or whatever and um but after that really decide on a niche like who it is that you want to serve now i wouldn't just say oh i'm gonna serve everybody because once again your business person now, right? <laughs> it ain't it ain't that you just caught you got all these people lined lined up to come to you to you. So being more strategic is you know picking that small population or that group that you feel called to. For me, it's students with learning disabilities, particularly those who are maybe low income and or who um in pay in situation um, just had not really encountered the right instruction and he was so far behind in, in his reading. So for you, it could be, hey, I, I just want to work with, you know, kindergartners or, you know, elementary school students. But whatever that is, pick that clientele, start marketing to that group, um, become the expert, you know, help people solve some of their problems, give parents some, you know, information or tips about, you know, working with homework, whatever that is, you have to put yourself out there. And I think that's another thing that sometimes teachers have uh, more of a challenge um, doing, right? But um, once you do all of that, figure out, you know, what your, um, whether or not you want like this, uh, project-based learning type of uh, a school or center. Uh, for me, it's just skill-based, right? So most of my students who come to me come to me with skill deficit. So my priority is re really working on skill and then being extremely creative uh, in how we are being repetitive to teach skills to older people, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of other things in between, you know, that you have to do, but we will be here all day. So, <laughs> I, you know, I've written on my blog of how to start a school. So if anybody's interested, there's a more step by step, you know, version of that. That's awesome. And we'll put those links in the show notes. The other like the flip side of things. Now, I want to talk about um, okay. parents like me who have kids that aren't don't fit inside the box, mm -hmm. who've kind of lost a lot of faith in the public education system. I mean, the stories you've referred a couple times to like the things teachers are dealing with today. And I mean, we've seen um, states that are, are determining what does and doesn't constitute history. There's been reports of teachers who are given literal scripts to read from when teaching their kids. And like, that's terrifying to me. My kids are not mm -hmm. in public school now. And the thought of putting them back in public school terrifies me. So like for somebody like me, um, how do I find these little micro schools? Like I'm personally not a teacher. 
So I'm not looking to start a school, but I would love to get my kids mm-hmm. involved mm-hmm. in a school. So can you tell me, first of all, I don't think we've talked about where your school is located. Let's talk about that. And then how do we find schools near us? What okay. are the Google terms we yeah. should be searching? Ooh, now that's a, a little bit harder, but I am located in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. So, um, however, I think, um, nowadays because of social media, like it is a huge, huge, um, resource. And I would kind of go and do some searches, especially on Facebook. There are all types of, uh, either homeschooling groups, learning pods. Um, even I have a private group um, where we have like ooh, about 800 teachers who are interested in starting their own small schools. So if you are a parent who is really interested, I would say if one, if you know other parents, you guys get together and then you start searching out maybe a teacher, someone that you can trust that's going to be able to deliver the type of instruction and create the right type of environment and that you guys support that person and starting your own little school. So um, it it might is I don't think there's a clear cut answer, but it's not as hard as you think either. I think there's a lot of us who are starting, you know, and, and for me, that's Social media media is a huge tool, right? Like that is kind of what I use to really put what I do out there and to try to connect with other parents, uh, particularly those parents who are kids are having issues uh, with learning differences as uh, a result of some type of, you know, learning difference or what have you. Awesome. This has been so amazing. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to share your story, to share the options that that other teachers have or that homeschooling parents have and the options that we have as parents when it comes to educating our kids is a tough topic. I, I never could have imagined I'd be dealing with it as much as I am now. Like you, some of my um, original thoughts, you know, going back was that I, I couldn't imagine ever not sending my kids to public school. I was a public school kid. I turned out fine. Those kind of yeah. things. And, mm-hmm. and, the past few years has really, <laughs> right, right, really yeah. changed things for me. So I want to thank you for being here. And I'd love if you would drop some links. Where can people connect with you, the, your website, social media? Where do you hang out? Oh, awesome. A little bit of everywhere. But I have a website. It is called www.theldcoach.com. I do blog in there. I'm also on YouTube, um, Cindy Lumpkin. So if you just search that name, it will pop right on up. And so I talk about anything from special education, teacher inspiration, as well as a couple of videos on how I started my school. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cindy. It's been a pleasure to chat with you today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was fun. All right, that is it for this episode of Familypreneur. Join us inside of the Familypreneur Business Accelerator to follow through on the action steps from this episode alongside an incredibly supportive community. Plus, access our robust training vault and a variety of exclusive monthly virtual events, including co-working, happy hours, and bonus training sessions head over to familypreneur.co and join us today. Until next time, I'll see you over in the Familypreneur Business Accelerator. Bye for now.